guys. First, I want to start off with a huge shout out to all the subscribers for the appreciation and support from the channel thus far. Fresh off the press from Flipper is that the US Customs have just released their container with 15k worth of flippers without any claims. Nice. Although they had to pay a 70 grand invoice of storage fees for the time they took with their investigations. Anyway, next week it looks like all US and Canadian customers will receive tracking numbers for their upcoming parcels. Whoop, whoop. Next we have a border disagreement with US customs with new orders that have come in once again. In a few days, uh, Flipper will be sending out 50% of orders via alternative logistical channels. So they're going to be using B2C parcels instead of batch cargo in going forward for those of you who have actually got your hands on a flipper i wanted to start off with a quick starter guide what i want to cover in the starter is to explain how the update firmware install databases and sd card portions of flipper work these are the core fundamentals before you even get started with the hacking portions now flipper zero's firmware is under active development and it's constantly changing thanks to the community input therefore it is important for us as a community member to understand how the device's internal architecture how the firmware works how to debug it if you've got any issues and how to collect those debug logs this way the community can grow and improve and get rid of all those gremlins power on as a safety precaution Flipper travels in the box in transport mode. In this mode, power is supplied only to the internal clock of the microcontroller. Now, unbeknownst to quite a few of you, it seems that there are two modes that Flipper actually has. You have a transport mode, and this is the mode the device is supplied with to the users. Only the built-in RTC domain clock is powered in this mode. The transport mode is activated through the menu under settings power and power off. On the other hand, we have working mode. The power is supplied to the device board. To switch from transport to operational mode, press and hold the return key for three seconds. That's the main button on the face of the flipper. Now to turn on the device, push and hold the button. If the device doesn't turn on, the flipper's battery may have been completely discharged. It won't turn on right away. Plug a USB cable to charge it and it will turn on automatically. If flipper doesn't turn on after charging, try rebooting it by pressing the left directional pad and the return key simultaneously. Installing the SD card. Keys, cards, remotes and databases are stored on the SD card. It's also required during the firmware update so it's important to install the SD card before updating the firmware. This is a big thing and it's an error I had when doing mine. Flipper supports a large capacity SD card but they don't recommend using SD cards no larger than 32 gig. Nani? Flipper utilizes very small files, it rarely exceeds 1 MB in size. So it makes no sense utilizing a huge SD card. Now in terms of installing the SD card, it should just snap into place into the port. In order for this to happen, it needs a little push. Now once this is inserted, you're going to feel a little bit of resistance, but it should sit flush within the flipper. If the SD card is successfully mounted, you will find a little SD card icon on the top left corner of the flipper. If it has failed, you get a not happy face mount failed icon instead. Now, if the SD card fails to mount, it probably has an incompatible file system. So please try to format the SD card to XFAT or FAT32 to use it with the flipper. Formatting your SD card. SD card support in flippers firmware is implemented using the FATFs library. In order for it to work, the SD card must be formatted to either the FAT32 or XFATS formats. Son of a bitch. Flipper recommends formatting the SD card using Flipper's built-in formatting tool. This is quite important. You can't just plug it in using an extension for your PC because I found some errors while doing this. You can do this by navigating to the following menu under Settings, Storage and Format SD card. What SD card to get? Now, like most things, not all SD cards are made equal. 
High quality branded SD cards have several physical interfaces that can be used for connecting to a device. We have SDIOs and SPIs. Now there's many off-brand or cheap counterfeit SD cards on the market just like you have in fashion or any other branded goods. And these don't have all the interfaces that work stably within those systems once inserted or in use. In some cases, one SD card works fine over high speed SDIO interfaces and is unusable over SPI. Flipper uses SPI, so it's important to choose a high quality brand SD card for your Flipper Zero. Now to test the speed of your SD cards in SPI mode, you can do this by going into settings, storage and benchmark SD card. You can find the average speed of the SD card on the SD card speed test after you've done the benchmarking. It's okay if the values you're getting are slightly higher or lower. If you're having problems with the SD card, however, it's best advice to simply try another one. What is stored on the SD card? So you might think the SD card is simply just the expansion of the memory of the system. It's not actually. The SD card is necessary to unleash the full potential of the Flipper Zero. You can use Flipper Zero without SD card, but you're putting yourself at a disadvantage here because the SD card stores the auxiliary files that Flipper calls databases. Many Flipper Zero features will not work properly without the relevant database sets on the SD card. I'll put a link below about the specific descriptions of the SD cards and what Flipper requires. These databases are copied to the SD card during the last part of the firmware update process because the firmware update process actually takes stages in free. I'll explain this later. This is why it's important to perform an update with the SD card already in place and not just trying to update your firmware when you first get the flipper. I made this mistake already. All user keys, signals, cards and remotes etc are also stored on SD card of course. This just relieves the internal expansion. You can access these files via the Q Flipper or through the Flipper mobile app also. Firmware update. Now Flipper Zero comes out of the factory with very old firmware version. This version is tied to the production process of testing and calibration of the device at the factory line. So it's important to update the firmware to the latest version right after taking the device at the box. Do not use the device while running factory firmware because it's hopelessly outdated, but also you have to plug in the SD card like I previously mentioned. You can update your Flippers firmware using the Flipper 0.1 update link, which I'll also put in the description below. QFlipper is the desktop application for updating Flipper Zero's firmware. Now, they wanted to make this more than just a click and update system. It's completely open source and written in Qt. It works on all major operating systems from Linux to Mac to Windows systems. In addition to updating the firmware, QFlipper applications will install the databases onto the SD card like I previously mentioned. Current update process. So the current firmware update process, like I mentioned, consists of several stages. First is the core firmware update process for the Flipper OS. The second is the firmware update process, which is the Bluetooth radio stack. And lastly, you have the database installation into the SD card. I know right now, Flipper have already mentioned it's quite a long winded process and they're working on better ways to simplify it. But from what I've experienced so far, this is how it runs. Now, from all the questions I received on my previous video, what I didn't really do and what I want to do now is to deep dive into the RFID protocol stack that Flipper Zero has and what it can do. RFID. Now RFID is a contactless radio tag technology. It's quite common and you can see it in a lot of places now from intercoms, bank cards, public transport, post offices, gyms etc etc the two main rfid tag types are high frequency and low frequency low frequency tags or 125 kilohertz work at higher ranges despite being insecure and dumb they still use primitive access control systems i.e getting into building intercom sports facilities etc 
On the other hand, we have high frequency tags ranging in that 13.56 megahertz range. These have lower effective range when compared to low frequency ones, but have more complex protocols attached to them. They support encryption, authentication, cryptography. These tags are commonly used in contactless bank cards to pay for public transport and in higher security access control systems. How RFID tags work. Now, this is an important topic to look at, especially when you're thinking how Flipper Zero interacts and works with this. Most RFID tags are passive tags with no internal power source. The chip inside it is completely turned off until the tag is exposed to a reader's electromagnetic field. So it's dependent on the actual reader. As soon as it comes within range, the tag's antenna begins absorbing the energy from the reader's EM field and then the chip receives the power to wake up. The chip then turns on and begins communicating with the reader. It's worth mentioning at this point that the tag's antenna is turned to a specific frequency, so the tag can only activate when it's inside a suitable electromagnetic field. RFID tag types. So we need to know the different type of tag types in order to exploit them or interact with them even. On the outside, RFID tags are quite different. You have cards that are fat or thin, key fobs, bracelets, coins, rings, and even stickers. So they come in different range types. Judging by their visual appearance alone, it'd be impossible for you to distinguish the frequency or protocol under that physical type of technology. Quite often, manufacturers use similar plastic cases for different types of RFID fobs operating on different frequencies so you can get two absolutely visually similar tags with totally different inside so it's worth considering when you try to distinguish the tag types so what i'll be looking at with you here is the two most popular types of rfid tags that you might use or come across in access control systems 125 kilohertz and 13.56 megahertz which one is which the easiest way to understand the range of rfid tags is operating on is to look at the antenna types now in your daily use of these things you've probably never even thought twice about these sorts of antenna types low frequency tags have an antenna made of very thin wire literally thinner than a hair follicle but such antennas have large number of turns therefore such an antenna looks like a solid piece of metal however high frequency cards have a significantly smaller number of thicker turns with visible gaps between them you can shine some lights through an RFID card and see the antenna inside. If the antenna only has a few large turns, it's most likely a high frequency antenna. If the antenna looks like a piece of solid metal with no gaps between it, it's most likely a low frequency antenna. Tag types. Low frequency tags are often used in systems that don't require high security, like building access, intercom keys gym membership cards etc really low infrastructure costs due to their higher ranges they are convenient to use for paid parking the driver doesn't need to bring the card close to the reader as it's triggered from further away at the same time low frequency tags are very primitive they have low data transfer rates. For this reason, it's impossible to implement complex two-way data transfers as such things as keeping balance between cryptography and security. Low frequency tags only transmit their short ID without any means of authentication. On the other hand, high frequency tags are more complex reader tags with interactions that need cryptography. A large two-way data transfer and authentication is needed in high frequency, hence the low distance. It's usually found in bank cars, public transports and other secure places. Like I said, the low frequency cards are dumb, non-secure and but have a long range. And the high frequency cards are quite smart, secure but use a shorter range. RFID in the Flipper Zero. 
Now the Flipper Zero supports both high frequency and low frequency tags which is why I love this sort of gadget. To support both frequencies they developed a dual band RFID antenna that is situated on the bottom part of the device. A separate NFC controller is used for higher frequency protocols. It takes care of everything related to hardware interactions with cards such as reading and emulation. Whereas the low frequency protocols are implemented programmatically via a custom analog front end that works in cooperation with the MCU and also allows to read, write and emulate. So you have a stack. I just love the science behind this, even just like visualizing it. During assembly, I've even seen their antennas are glued into the flipper's back panel and it connects to the PVC with pogo pins. This generally simplifies the assembly process for them as no cables are used and no UFL connectors are even required. Low frequency protocols. Now the low frequency tags as I mentioned have short IDs, just a couple of bytes long, essentially they're quite dumb. The tags IDs is compared to the ID stored in the database of the controller or on intercom. However, the card will transmit its ID to anyone asking as soon as it receives power. So just a little bit of attention and that s will drop basically. <laughs> Quite often the ID is inscribed on the card itself so you can take a picture and input it into the flipper manually if needed. Now there's a triad of the popular 125 kilohertz protocols, the first being the EM Martin. Now we have the EM4001 and the EM4002, the most popular protocol in CIS. Now this can read from about a meter because of its simplicity and stability. Next we have the HID PROX2. This is a low frequency protocol introduced by HID Global. This protocol is more popular in Western countries I've seen. It's more complex and the card and the readers for this protocol are relatively expensive. Last we have Indala. This is a quite old frequency protocol introduced by Motorola originally and then it was acquired later on by HID. It's less likely you're going to count this in the wild compared to the other two I mentioned. In reality there's a lot more low level frequency protocols but these are the most common ones you're going to come across. Now at the time when the flipper is writing to the card it can be read, saved, emulated and write to all three of these protocols. There may be other ones that are unfamiliar, but I'm sure Flipper is going to update their databases and within the firmware, there's going to be updates. So these 125 kilohertz subsystems can be implemented programmatically and they could just add them into the future ad hoc if needed. High frequency 13.56 megahertz protocols. High frequency 13.56 megahertz tags are a set of standards and protocols that are used universally. They are usually referred to as NFC or near field contact protocols, but that's not always the correct standard, at least worldwide. The basic protocol set used on the physical and logical levels is ISO 1443. High level protocols, as well as alternative standards, are based upon this. Now, the flipper can interact with both the low level ISO. 1443 protocol well as my fair ultra light data transfer protocol and emv used in bank cards it's kind of out of the scope of this post review that i'm kind of doing but i will be having a thorough look at the protocol standards that make up the nfc and it's worth doing this in a separate video altogether emv bank cards now EMV or EuroPay MasterCard and Visa is an international standard set for bank cards. Bank cards now are fully fledged smart cards with complex data exchange protocols and support for asymmetric encryption. Apart from simply reading the UID, Flipper can extract a lot more data from bank cards than I originally thought. It's possible to get the full card number, that 16 digit long number, the validity number, the validity date, and in some cases even the owner's name along with a list of recent transactions. However, since EMV standard might be implemented differently, the data 
that can be extracted may vary from card to card. So you can't read the CVV, but you can store the card within the flipper system. Bank cards are protected from replay attacks, so copying it with a flipper and then trying to emulate it to pay for something just won't work. That's not what it's used for. Conclusion. I've been more than impressed with what I've received as a bit of hardware. The community has grown so much. The channel itself has received a lot of love and appreciation for what it can do. The interest is there with the community. I will keep you updated. Please leave positive comments below about what you want to see, what you'd like me to explore more or any just general Q&As about Flipper and I will try to get the best information possible to you ASAP. Like I mentioned before, I know there is some stock and trouble issues. Always buy a Flipper from a reputable brand or company. I know you can see them on eBay for extortional prices. Obviously, there's a supply and demand issue right now. Those that have bought like 50 Flippers are trying to flip them, no pun intended, for 3x the amount in some cases. These, from what I've seen, are coming straight from Hong Kong. So if you got a connection in Hong Kong, that would be your best place to find a flipper quickly. Again, I'll catch you in the cyberspace. And peace out, guys.